All right, a lot to talk about. Let's bring in this morning's roundtable. Look who's back. Congresswoman-elect Debbie Dingell, I know you did not enjoy your, uh, the, the sabbatical from Flashpoint that you had to go on. I am very happy to be back. It's very good to have Thank you back. You. And congratulations on your victory Thank on Election you. Day. Next to her, the CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber, Sandy Barua, back with us. Uh, the uh, top lawyer for the City of Detroit Corporation Council, Butch Hollowell, back. And the business columnist for the Detroit News, Daniel House. Thank you all very much for being here. Daniel, let me start with you because you've written a ton about what happened on right. Friday. Uh, a pretty stunning thing that uh, when you when all, all taken together, isn't it, it? It is remarkable. It's remarkable the speed. It's remarkable the degree to which uh, a lot of the worst predictions did not come true. It's remarkable how this community came together and at the end of the day the fresh money that came that was pumped into this bankruptcy really came from the community or actors in the community. Uh, it's very remarkable. I think it's uniquely Detroit. Uh, people are looking for lessons here and in fact I think one of the things that Chief Judge Gerald Rosen said that he didn't want to do in the mediation was have anything that did set precedent. The whole thing was about not setting precedent mm -hmm. and by getting consensual deals uh, they've been somehow able to avoid that. I think it's very remarkable but now the hard work really begins. Of course. Yeah. The two big hammers are no longer there, the emergency manager and the bankruptcy court. Right. Uh, Butch, uh, Mike Duggan told us, Mayor Duggan told us many times he didn't think the city should go bankrupt and he didn't want an emergency manager a lot of this, but in the end, now that we're here, was it all for the best, or was there another way to do this? I don't know that he ever said that we shouldn't go bankrupt. What he said is that everyone agrees that the city was insolvent. It's just that the elected leadership, the that, mayor, that, that's better, should have gone that's a into bankruptcy. It. But more specifically, uh, one, there is precedent that has been said. This is the largest municipal bankruptcy in history. We've wiped out $7 billion off the books. The hard work uh, has already started. And uh, if you think about when the mayor got sworn in on January 1, he's got a new team in place that's world class. And we have been working. I get a job performance uh, uh, appraisal every Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock at Cabinet. <laughs> and each one of us are held to metrics that has never been seen before. And that's about how it should be if we're going to make sure that we give citizens the services that they deserve. You know, uh, we've got EMS now that's now delivering and uh, showing up at under 12 minutes for the first time since uh, January when it was at 18 minutes. So we're heading in the right direction. Sandy, you're, uh, you're charged with sort of selling this city and this region. Uh, it wasn't easy to do it as the largest city to ever go bankrupt. How is it now, uh, given the speed with which we emerged? Actually, it was. That is the one thing that everyone was always surprised about. When we went into bankruptcy, what the international investor community did was, oh, thank goodness you're finally addressing your problems. Now, they didn't come and invest in large numbers yet, but they're ready to do that now. But we got everyone's attention. What they didn't like about the, you know, the previous situation in Detroit was that they were justifiably saying that, listen, you're not really addressing your problems. You've got all these fundamental problems, the systemic problems, you're not addressing them. Yeah. When we filed bankruptcy, that sent a message to the international investor community, you guys are serious about this. Adults are now in charge. Then the election of Mike Duggan made another huge impression on, on the international investing community. So it's, it's been actually great for us. Interesting. Debbie, something I've been eager to ask you, and now I can that you're back uh, as a Democratic National Committee member, as a, a now to be a Democratic Congresswoman. I'm curious if, to have you handicap the job of Rick Snyder in all this. You can only say that Rick Snyder did a good job. Uh, he took on some very tough decisions that, quite frankly, I think Democrats would have not been willing to step up and do. Uh, I think that's why he got reelected, because people in Michigan shown, saw him show leadership in the city of Detroit. Well, that's pretty candid of you. Um, what happens now, though, uh, with a post-bankruptcy Detroit? Does that change uh, the job in Lansing? and Washington for that matter. Hmm. Well, I think there are a lot of things that have to uh, now happen. A lot of Mike Duggan's going to have a lot of tough work ahead of him being the leader. Uh, the governor and he are going to have to work very closely together. I think that there's one of the dynamics that people need to be very sensitive to is that they're emergency financial managers in a lot of other cities around the state and they keep saying, why does Detroit get all this help and why do the rest of us not get anything? I think people really need to, you know, we all laugh about Brooks, but southeastern Michigan is, hey, there are others of us out here, and why, we have to help sell and help everybody understand why Detroit's doing well is good for everybody, but other cities want some help too. But if I could also respond to what Daniel and, and, uh, and Debbie said in terms of the hammer, 
we have to balance our budget three years in a row mm -hmm. uh, and a report to the state financial advisory commission right. or we can remain in uh, state oversight for quite a long time so if we do it three years in a row which we uh, have every intention to do and I believe that we will do then the uh, commission goes dormant and then it goes away it's based on the New York model so those controls are in place but we also have 1.7 billion dollars in the plan of adjustment for restructuring initiatives 200 new cops 100 new firefighters plans to get at blight this is a good thing it feels different. This it all feels, feels different. different. This reminds me of after the bankruptcies in the auto industry, after they started to make the turn. I've been covering those companies for a long time all over the world, and it felt different. Hmm. There was a spring in the step. There were a lot of uh, burdens that these people had to carry. Every day they got up, they had to carry them. And the same thing with the city of Detroit. Every day they had to come in and they had to carry those burdens and deal with $7 billion in debt they're not going to have to deal with, and a whole host of other things that we could talk about. It just feels different. There's a, there's a sense of purpose and leadership in the city and in the state that is very refreshing. Lastly, though, with Sandy, before we head to the break, in the middle of all this coming together, did we finally have a moment where we ran back to our corners again when we had Brooks Patterson taking on Dan Gilbert and we saw a, a, a city suburb kind of fight break out? We haven't seen that in a while. Well, and it, you know, kind of makes us feel good that you know people are you know people who we expect they are. <laughs> but I, actually, I want to go back to Daniel's point because I think it's hugely important about the auto industry example. Let's remember what the auto companies did when they went through bankruptcy. Bankruptcy fixed their books; it didn't fix the companies. They took the opportunity of uh, using bankruptcy as a tool to restructure their companies, restructure their products, restructure their marketing. We need to do the exact same thing, and with the team that Mike has pull, pulled mm -hmm. together, I'm really confident we, we will do that. It's hugely important. All right, we'll move uh, to the ramifications of this past election day. We continue a quick break, and we'll be back with more on Flashpoint in just a moment. Back flashpoint in the break, I ask uh, a thumbnail assessment of uh, what happened on election day. And Sandy Barua, you said it was simply Democrats frowny face, Republicans smiley face. <laughs> you can do with this entire election with emoticons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you agree with that, uh, Congresswoman elect Dingle? Well, it's kind of hard to disagree with reality. It's a good night for you, but it was a, it was a great night for me. But uh, and we did win one of the statewide seats with uh, Gary Peters. Right. Uh, but obviously it was a tough uh, night for Democrats, and Democrats have to listen. Democrats have to well, see what, what the that, message that's is. That's my biggest question for all of you then. What is the mandate? What, 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 what were we being told by the electorate on election night? I think some of it was a reflection of how people felt about the president. There was no enthusiasm factor. Our voters didn't go to the polls. Uh, I think people are, I do believe that people are tired of the far right and the far left, and that people want to see people working together in the middle and if you look at a lot of the candidates elected they are people that are working in the middle towards solutions. You know, Debbie may be uh, in the minority party when she goes to Washington but she'll be the most senior member of the freshman class. Uh, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's, uh, it's but not it, exactly a rookie it, quite going through it. It's, yeah. a, it's a function of two things. It's quality candidates and turnout. You know, so a Debbie Dingell wins because Debbie Dingell knows how to connect with voters. Gary Peters wins because Gary Peters was able to connect with voters in what was otherwise a Republican year. But uh, it's also turnout. We've got to do a lot better job of getting out to the polls, mm -hmm. making sure that people understand that the votes do count. And when you look at the comparisons to, from 2010 uh, to this year, we did not see an increase, and in fact, we saw a slight decrease in the numbers of, who, uh, of voters who came out to the polls. That's a major problem. We should start earlier in the schools, maybe making voting as part of civics class. Gary, and Gary Peters also had a very weak candidate that he was running that, against. Uh, I mean, let's, let's. I was nicer to regardless the Republican whether you, are, you lean the R or D, were. it was a yeah, weak candidate. It was, it was rough. Uh, yeah. But what, what, what's your takeaway then with what we watched, uh, not just in Michigan, but nationally? Well, I, I don't think there's been some talk about anti incumbency. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think I heard the, the statistic that there were only two Republican incumbents in the House that actually lost. Mm. Um, so I don't think it was necessarily that, but I think it's clearly a message. And if to pick up on Debbie's point about people are tired of the right, the extreme right and extreme left, I think there's a lot some truth to that. Yet we see a president who comes out of these elections, and he's kind of going left again. Mm. And I think a lot of people are scratching their heads, thinking this is going to be a long two years for him and for a lot of other people. If that's that's the direction we need to go. I think people want to see some things happen. And now with the Senate majority, Republican majority, you might be able to get some budgets moved through the 
through, and I think you're going to see some legislation going to be put in front of the president. It's going to essentially dare him to veto it. But to be fair, we also have to look at the way in which we draw districts. I mean, it's just out of whack with where 435 it is. congressional seats open, only f uh, less than 50 of them truly competitive. Mm -hmm. It's just, tonight. it's really a disgrace how we do that. There ought to be a commission uh, where you are able to have a set standard for how you draw districts to make sure that they're not gerrymandered uh, so that it always favors the heavily uh, Republican or heavily Democratic areas. Uh, I think that's where the enlightened voting is going to be. Uh, we need to get rid of this talk of getting rid of the Electoral College, you know, here in Michigan. I think that's going to be an issue. I hope it maybe doesn't become mm -hmm. an issue. Uh, but I think the way that these districts are drawn on both the congressional level as well as on the state level have got to be relooked at. The old Soviet Politburo had more turnover than the U.S. Congress. <laughs> I'm serious. It's, it's exactly right. Yeah. It is. But Debbie, of course, the, other, the I guess the counter argument is when Democrats are in charge, they do the same thing with districts. This you is know, just I, how it goes. I actually agree with Butch on this. I'm not afraid. Look at what happened in California. You had some very right. ugly primaries, quite frankly, yeah. in California with Democrat and Democrat Republican. I'm for an object. I think democracy thrives mm -hmm. when people are invested and they get out and vote. And we've got to find a way that we've got to get people more motivated. That was the enthusiasm factor wasn't there. I'm not afraid of a commission. And a debate would be nice too. Uh, in a debate, we stopped debating. That's. I, I'm putting some of the blame on that on the media because clearly we've got to get our act together in creating a debate commission so that candidates understand that this is part of the drill. When you're going to be a candidate, you probably have to debate. Uh, but we've discussed that before on Flashpoint. Y'all, thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Again, congratulations, thank Debbie, you. on your win. And good to have you back on Flashpoint again. Great to be back. Good to have you with us on Flashpoint as well. Meet the press coming up next. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time right back here on Flashpoint.